good afternoon. Uh, my name is Susanna Miller Rains, and I will be your host today. Um, I work at the Center for Leadership and Disability at Georgia State University, and we are supporting parent to parent and focus in providing this webinar for families of children um, with special health care needs and disabilities to ask questions um, to Dr. Georgina Peacock. I'm going to turn it over to Francis from Focus to introduce Focus. Hi, guys. Um, I am Francis McBrayer, and I'm the executive director at Focus. I just want to take a second to tell you um, who we are and what we do. So, um, Focus serves children, teens, and young adults with disabilities age 0 to 29, regardless of diagnosis. And our mission is to embrace and equip families of children with disabilities to make everyday life better. You know, creating our big focus is on creating a community that helps us share resources, gain support, and helps us feel that we're not alone. And one of the ways that we do that is by hosting educational workshops like this one. We're happy to do that in collaboration with Parent to Parent of Georgia and the Developmental Disabilities Network. And we also have summer camps, activities for teens and young adults adapted swim teams, another, uh, uh, a number of other fun experiences for children um, with disabilities. So if you don't know about us, then I'll put our website in the chat box. I would love to have you reach out if you'd like to become part of the Focus Network. And now I'm gonna introduce you to Mitzi Prophet with Parent to Parent of Georgia and let her tell you a little bit about their organization as well. So good evening, everyone. I am Mitzi Prophet. I am in South Georgia. I am the PTI Director and Director of Support Services for Parent to Parent of Georgia. Parent to Parent of Georgia is the parent training center for the state of Georgia. We cover from birth to 26. We are a, we help with educational issues, health issues. So any issues you might have, just call us. We have coordinators all over the state. We are here to support you with any kind of issues you have, or we will direct you if there are services there to help you. Um, again, we have a great website, and again, the majority of us are parents of a child with a disability, which I know a lot of times when a parent calls, they're like, I want to talk to a parent. Well, that's what we are. So that's a really big plus when you want to talk to another parent who has similar issues or questions. So I am going to, um, I love always getting to introduce people. It always makes me excited. Um, I get the pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Georgina Peacock. She is a developmental behavioral pediatrician. She is currently serving as Georgia's Department of Public Health Chief Medical Officer. Her permanent job is as the Director, Division of Human Development and Disability at the CDC. And that is a mouthful. And that is amazing, too. So I am going to go ahead and turn it over to you. And let's hear this awesome stuff that we can't hear, that we came here for. Hi there. Um, so very delighted to be here today to share with you some information about the COVID vaccine. And um, really, uh, most of what I'd like to do is answer your questions. So I'm going to give a few introductory remarks. And then uh, we have some questions that were already submitted that Susanna is going to walk us through. And then, of course, I think if you have other questions, maybe you can post them in the chat. Is that right, Susanna? Yes, yeah, so if you have questions, go on and put them in the chat and we will make sure they get answered. And okay. if you need closed captioning services, I forgot to say this at the beginning, we have that available and we do have an ASL interpreter. You can pin um, ASL interpreter Paula to your screen if you need that. Okay, perfect. So with that, um, why don't we go to the next slide? So I'm gonna provide you, I just sort of talked about that already, but give you an introduction talk about the vaccine, talk about what we know about children and the vaccine, some safety and e efficacy information, and then we'll go to question and answer. Next slide. Next slide. So what do we know about COVID-19? As you know, um, COVID-19 is a, is a very new um, illness or disease to us. We've been experiencing it for about a year and a half. Um, but we're still learning a lot. But what we do know is that um, infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus causes COVID-19 uh, illness. And the illness can range from very mild or asymptomatic uh, symptoms 
to severe illness and death. And we don't know, we can't predict how SARS-CoV-2 will affect each person. And so that's why um, it's important to think about the preventive measures that we're going to talk about. We do know that certain people um, do have a higher likelihood of becoming severely ill. Those include um, adults over the age of 65, people with certain medical conditions and people with certain disabilities. Next slide. So how do we prevent COVID-19? Um, I think that almost all of you will know, know these things, but I want you to just um, look at this list today. Um, getting that COVID uh, vaccine is probably the best way to prevent COVID-19. Um, you also can wear a mask that covers your nose and mouth. Stay socially distanced or physically distanced from others about two lengths, uh, arm lengths apart. Washing hands often with soap and water, using hand sanitizer, avoiding touching your nose, mouth, um, and eyes with unwashed hands, which I know can be sometimes difficult if you're wearing um, a mask. I know that I find myself touching my mask um, at times. And then cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched surfaces daily. Next slide. So now some information about the vaccine. So as I said, um, getting vaccinated can prevent you from getting sick with COVID-19. In rare cases, people may um, get mild symptoms uh, from COVID after they're fully vaccinated, but COVID-19 vaccine is very, very good at uh, preventing severe illness and death. And I'm sure that you've been hearing in the news the last couple of days, there's been studies that show that the people that are hospitalized in the ICUs that are severely ill in the hospitals with COVID-19 are those um, by and large who have um, been not been vaccinated. There are questions about whether or not if you've gotten had COVID-19, should you still get vaccinated? Yes, you should, because we don't know how long that immunity lasts. And so it's very important that even if you had COVID-19, getting the COVID vaccine is important. The COVID vaccine is not a, a, a you're not injecting the, the um, uh, virus into you. A COVID vaccine is meant to help your body react so that when it does see the virus that you have an immune reaction and um, you don't get infected with COVID-19. So COVID vaccines cannot give you COVID-19. And finally, COVID vaccines will not make you test positive on one of those tests. So on the rapid test that you get, whether it's a um, rapid antigen test or the PCR test. Those are the ones that um, many of you may have had, but with, that you might go through a drive through to get, or you might go um, uh, get tested in a, in a doctor's office. You're not going to um, test positive on one of those because you were vaccinated. Next slide. So what happens uh, happened before um, the COVID vaccines were, were released. Um, they go went through the same type of clinical trials that other vaccines go through. So they um, first go through clinical trials with the pharmaceutical companies. When the pharmaceutical company then decides that they have enough data, enough clinical data to show that the vaccine is safe and effective, they submit all of that information to the FDA. The FDA then takes all of that information, they look at the um, uh, safety data from the clinical trials, they reanalyze it. So the scientists re-look at the data, reanalyze it and make a recommendation. Um, then they, then it moves to the CDC and the CDC has an advisory committee called the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices or ACIP. ACIP scientists do the same thing. They look at the safety data and then they make recommendations for use. And so this has happened now in the United States with Pfizer, with uh, Moderna or Pfizer Bio BioNTech, uh, Moderna and the uh, J Johnson and Johnson Janssen vaccine. Um, after the, those, uh, that authorization happens, and it's being rolled out in, um, in the community like we have seen. So millions of people now have gotten these vaccines. The FDA and CDC continue to monitor 
the vaccine safety and the side effects. There's two ways they do that. One is through um, the VAERS system, which is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. That is a system that is set up for all vaccines. So if a healthcare provider, a, an individual or a public health person observes a, um, a, a side effect or something that happens around the same time as that vaccine, they can report that to the VAERS system. The VAERS team looks at those reports and then they um, may contact the um, healthcare provider for more information. They may wanna look at the medical chart and they make a determination as to whether they think that that side effect was associated with the vaccine. The other thing that's been put into place um, for specifically for COVID vaccines is vSafe. So vSafe is something that's new. It's something that people can sign up for either on the web or on their smartphone after they get vaccinated. It asks you um, how you're feeling and any side effects that you're having for a couple weeks after um, you get the vaccine. And um, it also gives you a reminder when uh, you need to get your second shot if you've got a vaccine where you need a second one. So this has provided CDC with a lot more data, a lot more understanding of real time side effects that people are having related to um, the disease and I mean, sorry, uh, related to the vaccine. And um, these are the systems that are in place that um, and we can talk about this a little later that helped us notice that with Johnson & Johnson in very rare cases, um, blood clots can occur. Um, and also um, you may have recently heard about some uh, uh, pericarditis or myocarditis that is happening uh, sometimes in people following the Pfizer, second Pfizer dose. Um, these are both very rare side effects, but because so many people were reporting to both VAERS and VSAFE, we were able to notice those early and understand um, what was going on and, may, and CDC and FDA then made some recommendations about um, those, those particular side effects. Uh, next slide. So, um, COVID vaccination is really the best way to build protection. Um, when you've had the COVID uh, disease, so when you've been sick with COVID, you may get some natural protection or immunity. We don't know how long that protection lasts. Um, and we also know that the risk of severe illness and death from COVID-19 far outweighs any benefits from natural immunity. So you don't wanna go out and just get COVID-19 um, from somebody who is sick. Um, it's much better to be vaccinated to protect yourself as opposed to trying to get natural immunity. Um, next slide. So what uh, should you do um, before you get vaccinated? Learn about COVID vaccines, listen to um, you know, informational sessions like this, ask questions, ask your friends about the side effects they may have had, ask your healthcare providers um, if you have um, particular questions, um, you know, and learn as much as you can so that you feel informed when you're going to get that COVID vaccine. During the vaccination, you will get a fact sheet or you will be, have been given access to get a fact sheet. So uh, in some cases, people are providing that electronically. You can always ask for a paper copy of that when you go to get your vaccine. And you'll receive a vaccination record card. It's really important that you keep that. Your vaccination is recorded in a vaccine uh, registry. Um, for public health purposes, so so that people, you know, um, uh, so that there's a record of that vaccination. However, I think it's really important to keep that uh, vaccination record card and bring it back to your next vaccination if if you're getting a two dose vaccination. A lot of people, if they have a phone, take a picture of their vaccination record card so that they have that in case they lose it. It has inf important information on it, such as um, when you got it, where you got it, and um, the lot number of that vaccine. 
And afterwards, some people do have some side effects. The most common side effects are uh, pain in the arm. Um, you may um, get some headaches, some fever, some muscle aches. Typically that lasts about 24 to 48 hours. If you do get those side effects, most people don't get side effects. I'd encourage you to enroll in VSAFE um, so that you can report um, the side effects or health concerns you may be having, because that helps us understand what's happening to the millions of people who are vaccinated. Um, and then continue to use the measures to protect yourself. You're not fully vaccinated until two weeks after your um, second dose, if it's Pfizer or um, Moderna. And um, two weeks after that one dose if you get the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine. Um, once you're fully vaccinated, CDC recommends that you don't need to wear a mask anymore. Um, and so that's um, two weeks after you get the, you're fully vaccinated. Next slide. Uh, so what do we know about um, children with developmental disabilities um, during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, we know that children with uh, developmental disabilities or disabilities in general do have greater health care needs. So they ha typically um, can have uh, more asthma. We um, do see higher obesity rates in, in certain disabilities. Uh, we do see, um, you know, more um, need or, or use of the healthcare system. We see a lot of reliance on community-based services. Um, those may be therapy services, they may be um, other kinds of social services, and um, then uh, mental health concerns. We know um, that there are uh, higher numbers of um, co-occurring mental health conditions in pe people or children with disabilities. And we also know that um, there have been, um, you know, challenges during this pandemic related to um, isolation, related to not being able to get typical services, and whether that's related to um, the mental health concerns or other needs related to disabilities. Next slide. And we know that there's also an intersection between disabilities and, and different kinds of healthcare needs. So whether that is a child that may have a birth defect, a child that has a developmental disabilities, someone who may have an acquired disability, and then there's an intersection. So with uh, uh, children that have those, um, those initial findings, they may also have a higher uh, likelihood of having underlying medical conditions that can affect um, things in many different activities or domains. So we know um, that there may be challenges um, with some of these things that are listed here, um, social relationships, hearing, thinking, remembering, um, communicating, and all of that can put a person or a child with a disability at higher risk for complications from COVID because you may, it may be your underlying medical condition that puts you at higher risk, or it may be an access to a healthcare system or lack of access to a healthcare system, lack of ability to communicate, maybe not being able to wear a mask and so that there may be um, some increased exposure. So there's different reasons why we people with disabilities are at higher risk for, for complications from COVID and these are just some of those. Next slide. And then um, there have been studies, and I will say that th these studies are not in children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. The data that we have and that's been published, and you'll see this uh, publication at the bottom, um, is about adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and what this study found was that adults with developmental disabilities were more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19, and they also had higher risks of hospitalization, ICU admission, and death. Next slide. And this is um, switching gears a little bit, but just a reminder that um, in addition to um, getting the COVID vaccine, it's also really important that children receive those routine vaccinations that are on the recommended schedule. So what we have found is that many children during the pandemic 
um, got behind on their routine vaccinations. And I know that here in Georgia, there are some required vaccinations at kindergarten, at seventh grade, and at 11th grade. And so there is um, an attempt by the public health uh, system to make sure that there's availability of back to school clinics um, with uh, the routine vaccinations. And many of those clinics are also offering COVID vaccine at the same time. The CDC ACIP did make a recommendation that you could get um, routine vaccinations at the same time as um, the COVID vaccine. And so that's something to keep in mind. Um, it, so, um, whoops. Sorry. So, Something happened to the slides, sorry. Okay. A sensitive mouse, I'm sorry. Okay, all right. Um, so just a reminder that um, the Vaccines for Children program provides vaccine at no cost who may not otherwise be vaccinated because of an inability to play. So essentially, Vaccines for Children provides half of U.S. children um, uh, vaccinations. And so um, if someone doesn't have health insurance, the vaccines are provided for free. And this is these routine immunizations as well as the COVID vaccine. Uh, next, next slide. So I did want to include, and this is kind of a busy slide, and, and I'm not going to talk about all of it, but I did want you to see the four different vaccines that are in um, different stages of clinical development and um, where the current status is related to children. So there is, well, children and adults. So in the BioNTech, Pfizer, and Moderna vaccines, those are two doses of a vaccine. They're both approved under emergency use authorization. Um, and uh, I just noticed there's an error in this slide. So um, the Pfizer BioNTech is for uh, approved for 12 years up, um, and Moderna is still 18 and up. Janssen is approved as a one dose for 18 and up, and then the AstraZeneca is still in its phase three of its clinical trial, so it does not have any um, authorization here in the United States other than you know, I mean, people may be on clinical trials, but it's not approved for emergency use right now. Um, there have been studies that have been done in all in children, both for the Pfizer BioNTech and the Moderna. Um, we expect that um, there will be enough clinical data that the companies will be able to submit that probably in early fall, and um, then. And we're expecting that that will probably go down to about the age of two. We never know exactly until the pharmaceutical company submits their information. Um, and it's, so it's dependent on what their clinical trials show. But the, some of the things that they're looking at when they're doing these clinical trials as they're um, going down in age is they're looking to see, for example, does, um, does a child, should a child get the same dose as an adult or should they get a smaller amount um, and they can still get that immune reaction. Um, and so they're looking, they look at um, sort of different, different characteristics of the vaccine uh, as well as safety and efficacy. Next slide. And some of the uh, considerations that I think it's important to have um, for a child with disability is that, um, you know, getting a vaccination could can be anxiety producing. And so um, we have found that sometimes it's easier for children, especially children with developmental disabilities, to get vaccinated maybe in their vehicle. So going through a drive through um, in a quiet area, maybe there's a space that has been made into sort of a sensory um, uh, sort of a sensory room or something like that. Having trained providers is really important. And I would encourage you um, to, you know, maybe ask, does your um, pediatric provider, your pediatrician, your family practice provider um, have the vaccine? Because um, 
they are experienced with providing vaccinations to children. And so that may be a more comfortable way to get vaccinated than maybe going to, um, you know, a, a pharmacy or something like that. Certainly, um, you know, the, you can get vaccinated in pharmacies, you can get vaccinated in health departments, there's a lot of community events, but you know your child best. And I think thinking that through a little bit is, is important. Um, we have, through the Department of Health, um, made it possible for pediatricians or other healthcare providers to order smaller numbers or smaller doses, numbers of doses, so that um, they don't have lots and lots of vaccine in their office and worry about, you know, not being able to use all of it. Um, so we have tried to make that available so that children can get vaccinated in their healthcare provider office if that is something that the healthcare provider is willing to offer and that families do want. Next slide. So I think in summary, um, the COVID vaccines are safe and effective um, and uh, the, they have gone through a sort of a rigorous look um, from the FDA and from CDC in pre-clinically, uh, sorry, pre-approval. Pre um, and millions of people have received the COVID vaccine. Um, and so we have learned more since that has happened. And um, there have been a few um, recommendations that were made. Um, the most recent was looking at uh, the association of myocarditis with the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. This has been seen it, it in um, young males. And um, they looked at the data. It's a short-lived event for the most part in these um, young males and therefore the CDC did not change their recommendation um, that children over the age of 12 can get the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine um, because the, the um, risk of you know, illness from COVID-19 far outweighs um, the risk from um, that side effect. And so um, CDC recommends that you get the COVID vaccine as soon as possible. The president has set a goal of trying to get 70% of people vaccinated by um, July 4th. Uh, I think we're probably moving a bit slower in Georgia, but we're certainly continuing to make progress. We're trying to provide vaccines where people um, are. So whether that's a community center, a church, um, uh, you know, outside a grocery store, uh, in pharmacies, in healthcare provider offices, in health departments, um, and then working with a lot of partners. We're working with the um, Latin American Association and other um, Hispanic groups. We're working with Black and African American groups. And actually, you know, if you all are interested um, and are part of a group who would like to host an event, we are happy to work with you. Earlier in our vaccination um, rollout, we did partner with Walgreens to do special vaccine clinics for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we're able to vaccinate probably about a thousand Georgians in that way. Um, that was a place where uh, people could come, they felt comfortable, they knew where they were going, that might be a supported employment um, situation or something like that. And um, you know, we were able to vaccinate people with disabilities in that way. Um, next slide. And so here are some of those resources. Um, you can go to the DPH website. You can go to vaccinefinder.org. Um, you can also call this um, health department resource line. It is in Spanish and in English, um, and they can help you sign up for a vaccine if you um, are not able to use the website. And honestly, in probably most parts of Georgia, um, what I have seen is that there is vaccine available uh, within about five miles of most people um, across the country. And so most um, pharmacies, you don't need an appointment, um, but uh, you know, these are some other places to find information um, and to, to make appointments for vaccination. So uh, with that, I think that's my last slide. Um, and so I'm happy to take some questions. 
Thank you, Dr. Peacock. Um, I do have some questions here. And if people have other questions for Dr. Peacock, um, please type them in the chat box. Um, if you are on the phone, we will um, have some time in a little bit for those on the phone to unmute and ask their questions. Um, so thank you for those who have sent their questions ahead of time. I'm not gonna read the entire question, um, but I will read the essence of the question um, for Dr. Peacock. So the first question is, has any research been done of children with compromised immune systems and heart issues who have taken the vaccine? Um, and I think a secondary question related to that is in the chat box, specifically individuals with Down syndrome who tend to have more heart related issues with their disability. So the, the way that clinical trials are, are um, designed, they, um, you know, tried to take a broad swath of the, the population. I don't have the details on, on exactly who was included in clinical trials. That's more in the NIH's um, sort of wheelhouse. And so I think um, the, the NIH would be a good place to get some more information on exactly who was included. Um, the, uh, what we know about immune systems is that um, there have been, um, we know more right now about adults than we do about children because more adults have gotten the vaccine. But what we have seen is that some people with compromised immune systems don't react to the vaccine as well. So they're not as protected after they get the vaccine. Um, those tend to be people that are on um, either uh, very high um, uh, doses of steroids or people that may be on, you know, sort of a, a significant um, biologic, um, say, uh, treating rheumatoid arthritis, for example, or lupus or something like that. So there is a potential that if you have a compromised immune system, you won't react as much to that vaccine. Um, and so I think to take that one step further, it's extra important. Um, I mean, I, I, I believe that everybody should be vaccinated. But um, it's really important that if you do have a child that has a compromised immune system and you don't know how, how they're going to react or if they're going to react um, um, to that getting that vaccine, that the people around that person also get vaccinated. Thank you. Um, the, the second part of one of the questions was, does this put um, our kiddos an increased risk for severe side effects. So if they're immune compromised um, and they're not having the, the same kind of reaction. It shouldn't put them at increased risk for severe side effects. So um, the side effects, the majority of people have fairly mild side effects. So they have um, either no side effect or they have um, pain in their arm is the most common side effect. Um, other side effects could include um, fever, um, a headache or uh, body aches. And that typically is um, self-limited. So it, it typically lasts maybe 24 to 48 hours. Um, but it, I, I don't know of any evidence um, that shows that um, children with compromised immune systems would have more severe side effects. Thank you. Another question is um, in regards to young people who might not um, use formal language to communicate. And um, a parent asked, how will I know if he feels any of the silent side effects? My son with autism may not be able to communicate problems or side effects from the vaccine. And I want to know what I should be looking for. So I think, you know, I think I said earlier, um, you all know your children best. And so I think, you know, similar to say when a child might have um, a tooth abscess or they might have um, uh, some other kind of um, an ear infection, something like that. Um, often, you know, I've worked with parents um, who sort of know, know that their child is having an issue, but they're reacting kind of in a different way, right? They're having behavioral difficulties. Um, they may be more angry. They may be sleeping more, something like that. And so, you know, if after your child gets the vaccine, they're acting differently, 
then that, that could be a side effect. Like I said, those side effects typically last 12 to 24 hours. So it's not gonna be a long time that you would expect to see changes. So if, if someone got a vaccine and then they're still having sort of differences, uh, you know, a number of days later, it's probably not due to that vaccine. The other thing, you know, I mean, if, if a child um, gets a fever, I would treat that fever. So, you know, fevers don't, you don't feel good when you get a fever. Um, and that can also in some children with developmental disabilities, increase behavioral issues. It can increase seizures in some cases. So you want to treat a fever um, if uh, someone does get that fever, like you would normally if you, you know, if a child got a fever from a respiratory illness or something like that. So another question was in relationship to epilepsy, do you know if there's any information out there on possible side effects of the vaccine with children with epilepsy? I have not seen specific, um, specific information related to children with epilepsy. Again, because fevers can decrease your seizure threshold, it would be important um, if you have a child with um, epilepsy uh, that if a child is having a seizure or, you know, even if they're having pain in their arm um, that, that could be treated well with, um, you know, a, a antipyretic sort of like ibuprofen or, or Tylenol to go ahead and treat that so that the child um, doesn't, you know, have a high fever that might precipitate a seizure. Thank you. So we've had this come up a couple of times. Um, so is the vaccine recommended for children that meet the age requirement, but are still smaller for their age? So that is a, that's a good question. Um, it is an age-based recommendation. So the, the, the recommendation is for, for the Pfizer buyer NTech is 12 years and older. We expect that there will be a recommendation for uh, Moderna coming soon. Um, and, you know, if your child is, is very, very small, so significantly smaller than a typical 12 year old, I'd have a conversation with your healthcare provider about that to see whether um, it makes sense to go ahead and give that vaccine or, or wait until um, there's more information about children who, who weigh less. But, um, you know, that, that's really a sort of a clinical one-on-one -on -one decision. Um, the, the actual recommendation is that children over the age of 12 uh, can get the vaccine. So we have another question that says, my son is 19 months old. He has um, a couple of different disabilities. Why can't babies be protected with a vaccine? So I guess under two, you know, thinking about that piece. Yeah, and they may, we don't know exactly where the next cutoff is going to be. So when Pfizer actually first was approved back in December, no one knew that they were going to say it was 16 and above. They thought they were going to say 18, but there was enough data there, enough clinical data to make the recommendation 16, which meant we could protect people, you know, that age group faster. And so um, we don't know exactly what the recommendation will be this fall. Um, the goal is, you know, to, to go as low as the data allows us to make a recommendation for safety and efficacy. Um, what I would do is, uh, you know, if your 19 month old um, does have sig significant um, challenges or and health conditions, make sure that everybody that is in the vicinity of that child, so the loved ones around that child are all vaccinated. Thank you. Um, here's another question. My son has a rare genetic disorder and he had a reaction to the pertussis vaccine um, and they want um, further research indicates that aggravation to the nervous system could cause a reoccurrence of seizures. Is this something I should worry about when deciding whether or not to give my 12 year old the COVID vaccine? Yeah, I would talk to your neurologist about that. Um, it's a very a sort of specific situation. And I think the best thing to do would be to talk to somebody who is very experienced with, um, with epilepsy and with seizures to help you make that decision. 
what kind of effects will the COVID-19 vaccine possibly have on a child with autism? Um, a two-year-old is what the actual question says. Okay, so right now, um, you know, it's not recommended for two year olds. So right now, um, only people 12 years and older can get the, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. Um, we um, don't have any reason to believe that it would affect a child with autism differently than any other children. And, you know, believe that um, getting the COVID vaccine is protective against getting severe. Um, illness from, from COVID, which, which is important. While not many children get severe illness, so, so by and large, the people who are most severely affected by COVID illness are people over 65. We do know that children um, can get side of, or can get um, severe illness from COVID. And uh, we know that the children that get COVID these more severe symptoms from COVID have certain underlying conditions, including asthma, um, obesity, and medically complex conditions, which some children with disabilities fit into that. So those are the children that are at highest risk for complications um, from COVID. So. All right, thank you. All right, we have um, in the chat box, you mentioned people that will be around our children should be vaccinated, but if we choose not to vaccinate yet, but school doesn't offer virtual options, we will be in a tough spot because we won't know who in the classroom has in fact received the vaccine. Um, is that something that the Department of Health or another department will somehow make available or will we basically have to choose to keep them home to protect them? So I think, you know, there, there, there is a sort of an evaluation of risk um, and um, the recommendation is that people who are not vaccinated should wear masks. Um, obviously that is based on the honor system. So um, we, we, in most cases, um, employers and schools and other places are, are not requiring people to um, you know, say whether they're vaccinated or not. I will say colleges, interestingly, are, um, many colleges are saying that they will require that for college students in the fall. I do know that em some employers are um, not, not hiring new hires who are not vaccinated. So um, I read that Delta, for example, um, is, not is not hiring any one new employees that are not vaccinated. So. Um, there may be employers that are doing that. Um, I don't think that schools will do that in the state of Georgia. So um, it, you know, it, it does put people in a tough spot. It puts people in a tough spot. Um, I think that the safest thing, um, if you're going to be around others, is to get vaccinated because we know that it's very effective. So, um, you know, it's it's ninety four percent effective. Um, at keeping you from having severe complications um, and being hospitalized or dying from COVID. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question for Dr. Peacock? Well, if no one else has a question, um, we are still collecting questions. So if you think of something um, after this, we can, um, we can get the best answers we can. Um, we've got a Gmail account, um, gaddcovid19 at gmail.com. Um, we have another question that came in, so. Um, I was gonna say there have been some questions about Down syndrome. And one thing that I can look into and maybe I can pass it back uh, through you, Susanna, is there is a, a Down syndrome consortium that does a lot of research. And in fact, um, they published fairly early on um, some uh, information that said that uh, people with Down syndrome are at higher, higher risk for complications from COVID. 
Um, I suspect that that group is also looking at, at, at um, people who have Down syndrome that are vaccinated. Um, and so I will look and see if they have done that um, and uh, published any of that information. I don't know, but um, that they're a fairly active research consortium that might be able to provide us some additional information. And I think they just met last week. Um, I was talking to a colleague the other day. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Okay. Uh, this is Anne-Marie. Uh, yes, uh, I would like Dr. Uh, Peacock to go back to the list of the children who are most um, uh, exposed to the uh, virus than children with disability. My son is 21 and uh, we're planning to travel to Africa next week, uh, next month. Okay, is it safe for him to travel out of the United States or not? Um, I would probably not travel to a place. Um, it depends. I mean, obviously, it depends where you're going in Africa. I happen to know my sister is moving to Africa and the place that she's going, she's going to Uganda, has lots and lots of COVID right now. Um, and in fact, they're under a lockdown. But, um, you know, so I think the, the saying that, I think the first thing to do is look at how much COVID is there. I think I would um, be vaccinated before I went. Um, because uh, vaccination does reduce your risk for a hospitalization and death. And in many, many parts of Africa, not everywhere, but many parts of Africa, there's not as great an access to, um, uh, you know, ICU care and things like that. And so I think your best protection would be to be vaccinated. I would also see how much uh, COVID is in that area. Um, because that might significantly um, affect, you know, your ability to move around and um, quarantine mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, also, if you are going out of the country, it's important to know what the requirements are of the country that you're going into. They okay. may require um, uh, you to, to provide some evidence of vaccination or have to quarantine for 14 days. Um, and so looking at the requirements of um, the country you're going to is really important as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Emory. Does anyone else have a question for Dr. Peacock? Just so you know, um, the Down syndrome medical interest group, um, I put their a link to their COVID-19 page um, in the chat as well. So if we are afraid to vaccinate them now, do you anticipate a certain window of time that more data will be available so that we can reevaluate? So there's more data every day because more people are being vaccinated every day. I think I last looked, um, I may not, there are million, millions of people. Um, I, it's, uh, it's over 150 million um, uh, people have been vaccinated. And so that's all information that um, allows us to uh, understand the vaccine better. You know, what's I think important to understand is that we're racing against time a little bit because um, as people are not, while people are not vaccinated, the COVID, vac the COVID um, virus is able to, or SARS-CoV-2 is able to circulate more. And what we're seeing is we're seeing the emergence of what we call variants. And variants are changes in the vaccine or the changes in the virus um, that uh, can make it more infectious, can make it more severe. Um, and the one that you may be hearing about right now is the Delta variant. That was the one that has been seen in other parts of the world. It appears to be um, spreading in certain parts of the United States, mostly in areas such as the Southeast where there's less vaccination. And what we need to have happen is we need to suppress that because we don't want a different um, uh, variant to appear that the vaccine isn't as good 
protecting against. So the Delta variant, um, what we know, um, just to give you a comparison, so um, the other variants that we had, I think there was an alpha variant that we had, and if you got the Pfizer vaccine, if you got one dose, it was about 50% effective against that first dose. Once you had two doses, about 94, 95%. With the Delta variant, it's 30% effective after one dose. Um, and then if you get two doses of um, the Pfizer, you're back at 94%. And so we know that um, the Delta variant is, um, you know, can spread more easily. We're seeing it spread. And what we don't want is other variants to start um, appearing so that, that we don't have a, a vaccine um, to protect against. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you. I know that one of the issues that we've talked about is that um, disability identity isn't being captured um, in some of these places. Um, is there anywhere that there's research or that disability um, is being captured? So we will know if you know someone has epilepsy or Down syndrome. There is. So um, there are two large national vaccine um, surveys, the National Immunization Survey and something called the PULSE survey. I don't know what PULSE stands for. Um, both of those uh, surveys um, are surveys that are used in the vaccination world to understand lots of different vaccines. For the first time ever, they include uh, questions about disability. And we should have that data um, probably in the next month to, to six weeks. Um, and we'll be able to put some of that information out. Thank you. Um, so we have a question again. Um, and so if you could address briefly again, why at this point babies can't be vaccinated. So babies can't be vaccinated because um, the, the vaccine is not yet authorized in uh, babies. So the way um, vaccine trials work in the United States is that vaccines are first tested uh, in adults through clinical trials. And then once there is um, a look at that data in adults, they start, um, you know, incrementally going down um, to smaller, younger and younger ages. Um, and uh, part of the reason for that is that um, there needs to be um, more things looked at when you're vaccinating children, such as the dose. Do you need the same dose? Do you need a smaller dose than an adult? And so, and, and frankly, we're just more careful with children. So, so uh, the trials are first done in, in adults and then um, extended down. So we do anticipate that eventually these vaccines will be approved in uh, babies or infants. Um, but we're just not there yet. Thank you. All right, we have a couple more minutes. Does anyone else have a question for Dr. Peacock? All right, I'm going to share the contact information one more time. Well, I had it up and I deleted it, or I took it down. All right. Any last questions? Uh, yes, Anne Marie again. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes, my last. Uh, yeah, my last question uh, is that: um, Is there any website that could indicate which countries have the highest uh, rate of virus or not? How can I find out? Yeah, so you should be able to go to the CDC um, travel website, but I can, um, I probably can't find it quick enough to get it to you right now, but I could send that to Susanna. So um, I would probably Google CDC COVID travel advisory and it'll list, you can actually look at that yeah. for, for any child, I mean, any, any disease and it'll tell you, um, you know, how much, whether you've got a lot of that in a country or not. Okay, thank you. 
Um, yeah, oh, there it is. It's up on the web, on the... Um... Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right, so if you do have um, any questions, I put the, the GADD network um, COVID email in the chat box. There's also a DPH COVID-19 vaccine email as well um, that is available. So thank you all for your time. Thank you, Dr. Peacock, especially for your time and sharing your expertise. And we will work to get um, a FAQ from these questions and others out to you all um, soon. And we will have this recording available um, soon as well. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.